Perfect. Okay. Okay, so welcome everyone to our um, online presentation tonight by James Maher on uh, street photography. James has lived in New York for his entire life, and like many Manhattanites, he is a terrible driver and cook, but he's an excellent navigator. He has been practicing the art of street photography since he picked up his first camera. He has worked as a portrait studio and documentary photographer in New York since 2005, and is a certified New York photographer tour and workshop guide. And he is also the author of the New York Photographer's Travel Guide and the Essentials of Street Photography. So welcome, James, and we're really happy that you were able to be with us tonight and do this webinar for us. Oh yeah, I'm really happy to be here. Um, hope everyone's doing well. Um, today I'm going to give a kind of presentation that goes through just all the way from beginner to what I think are kind of advanced um, street photography um, topics. So we'll talk about um, all of that stuff. Uh, just before I do go into all that stuff, I wanted to um, just show you, uh, because I'll, I'll be um, showing uh, the presentation screen so you can't see me during it. Uh, just the cameras that I like. I think street photography can be done with any cameras. Um, and we'll talk about all that stuff. But uh, I love the Fuji cameras. I love the small Fuji X100. And I use this for my really busy city kind of crazy type of work uh, just to be kind of uh, discreet. Um, and then I also use, uh, it might sound counterintuitive, we'll talk about it, but um, I shoot a lot in quieter areas. I live in a quieter area of Brooklyn, so it's kind of more suburban feel and I kind of love shooting in those areas. Um, and for that type of work, I actually use a much bigger um, GFX and medium format camera. And I'll talk about why that, you know, might seem a little, um, you know, it might not make sense to, you know, use a bigger camera in quieter areas, but uh, I'll talk about that. Um, and so, you know, street photography will go into uh, the busy city stuff, but then we'll also talk a lot about um, shooting it in quieter areas. I think you can kind of do it anywhere. Um, so I'm going to uh, share my screen really quick. Make sure I get that right. Okay, okay great. Slideshow, play from start. Okay, so the topic today is um, an introduction to street photography from beginner to advanced topics. And I'm gonna show a lot of my work um, throughout this. I'll comment on some of the photographs. Um, I'll leave some of them without comment. Um, at the beginning of the presentation, you'll see that, um, you know, there's uh, a lot of disparate work. There's color, black and white, kind of different types of things. As I get more towards the um, advanced stuff and I talk about projects and things, um, you'll see the work become uh, much more consistent. So the first thing to talk about um, is just the gen general definition of street photography. It's a really kind of almost clunky term. Um, it means different things to different people and it's uh, very difficult to define. So I'm gonna explain kind of what my definition is of it uh, as best I can. Um, so street photography is candid photography of life, culture, and human nature. It's a way for us to show our surroundings, how we perceive them and how we relate to them. Um, the how we relate to them part is extremely important in my opinion. Um, I, I see this type of work as kind of a mixture between kind of documentary work um, and personal work. Um, whereas documentary work is often you trying to kind of separate yourself a little bit from the scene and kind of, you know, not really influence it as much as a photographer. Street photography, on the other hand, I think um, it's, it's, you know, there's a lot of influence. Um, when you look at the work at street photographers who have done this for a really long time, no matter, no matter if they have a project in color or black and white or no matter what they're shooting, you can really, as they develop, start to sense their personality behind the photographs um, and their point of view. And I really think that's kind of uh, where the, just the art in this genre lies. Um, we're filtering what we see to find moments that intrigue us. Um, you know, that's why when you see many photographers photographing the same exact areas, often their work looks um, completely different. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, it's not just on the street or in cities. Um, it can be done almost anywhere. Um, and people don't have to be present in the photographs uh, for it to be a street photograph. Uh, this is a, a portrait here, um, but, you know, portraits, you know, technically street photography is, you know, defined to be candid photography, but, you know, portraits are a huge part of it. And whenever I do portraits, um, I always try to find a moment that's candid where the person may not be thinking I'm photographing or might look like they're, um, 
you know, in their own world a little bit. Uh, and I think that can really help uh, with these portraits. It also helps if they have uh, the Louis Vuitton logo tattooed on their head. And I like to show these two together. This is a photograph from um, uh, a very touristy place um, in New York, a bathroom. Uh, and it's just really fascinating when you read all of the uh, different messages. Um, you know, this is this was taken about, I think, maybe five years ago. And, uh, you know, there's already, a, I can't breathe on the top here. Uh, Kill the rich, eat, eat your young. If you read through these things, it's, it's pretty fascinating. So ethics, laws, and um, don't be a creep. Um, uh, street photography is, um, it's legal in the US and UK um, uh, for artistic and educational purposes, and it's not legal for commercial and advertising purposes without a moderate release. Um, obviously, whenever ever you travel, um, it's good to look into your local laws and to see what, you know, is going on. But I also think there's often a lot of gray area. So I think it's um, often a really good idea to look at the work of other street photographers in the area, um, maybe hop on Instagram or, you know, do something like that just to get an idea of what people are doing. And what this means is, you know, you can use these photographs without a model release um, in any way that you might, you, you know, show a painting um, or uh, any, type of, any type of art. Uh, so you can, you know, put it in a gallery, you can put it in a book, you can use it to, you know, advertise that book or gallery, but you can't use it for, um, to promote a product um, or to insinuate anything about the person uh, in the photograph that might not be real. Um, so that's kind of the, the general um, baseline uh, for, for many countries, but there are a lot of uh, different, differing laws per country. It's important to be smart and respectful, of course, uh, about who you photograph. Um, it's definitely not always worth it to take someone's photograph. Um, I think, you know, this genre, um, you know, I've been shooting it for uh, nearly 20 years and, and really in the last, the way I'll, I'll tell you about a lot about the way I like to shoot. Um, I do get close. I, I, you know, I do try to get kind of intimate photographs, but you know, in the last five years, I haven't had one person stop me. I mean, it's happened uh, to me uh, many times before, but um, you know, really the way I like to shoot it, it, people kind of really don't notice me that much um, or just kind of let me be. But one of the things that I do because is if I see someone that, you know, maybe the photograph will be pretty good, um, but, you know, if I don't feel good about photographing the person, even if it's a good photograph, you know, I, I, I won't do it usually, you know. Um, and it's important to know just the term, it, it can be a little creepy, uh, but that's okay. Um, we're doing this type of work because uh, we like people, we like culture, and we're trying to show that. Um, and it, it's, uh, you know, we're trying to show good things. We're trying to uh, share what we're feeling about um, our society and our surroundings. But it is important to know how other people perceive you or be aware of that when you're out. Um, so, you know, think about how you're walking around, think about how you're, you're looking, uh, and that will take you a really far away um, if, you, if you think in those terms. And this last tip I just uh, like to put in there from working with a lot of photographers over the years. There are some photographers I see who, when they're learning, they'll, you know, stop and they'll see something they, they, that they love and they'll just take, you know, 100 foot, they'll shoot, 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 shoot. And that can really um, get uncomfortable sometimes. Uh, so, you know, when I say think about how the other person as well, um, that's important. Uh, of course, if a scene is developing, if more people are coming in and it's, you know, changing, you know, by all means stay there as, you know, as long as you need to get the photograph. Um, but, you know, if, if nothing's changing, you know, get the photograph and move on and make it a, a, a pleasant experience, you know, it, it, as opposed to kind of making that person uncomfortable. This is a, a local newsstand guy uh, near where I used to live, Jerry. Um, and this was a, a candid moment, but I did wait for um, him to look up uh, at me. Um, one of the most important things uh, in this type of work, I think, is, is the look in people's eyes. Um, that's one of the best ways to show emotion, to show feeling. And so whether it's a portrait or a candid shot, um, you know, really the first thing I always try to look for is I try to look um, at people's eyes. And I, look, I try to find people who are feeling something. And you usually, more often than not, that's that's through the look in the eyes. Um, sometimes it's a gesture in a body or or something else. Now these are the major tips. I think if you learn these tips, uh, this will take you a, a really far way. Um, these are kind of just the things I think you need to know to um, really help you get a, a a far way into street photography. So the first tip is linger and let subjects come to you. Now I got into this genre because 
I love, you know, I love to walk. I like to explore. I like to get lost in, especially in New York where I live. Um, so it's not like you, you'd have to stay in a, one place, you know, at any point you can walk from place to place, but it's important to, you know, find a place where you think something interesting might happen or you get a good feeling and just wait there. Um, you can um, just, even if there's no people, you can wait there. If there's a lot of people, you can wait there. Um, it really doesn't matter. Just stop yourself and kind of look around. And this does a couple things. Um, the first thing it does is it, you know, really makes you a little bit more perceptive because you're not walking from place to place. You're really stopping yourself and fo uh, forcing yourself to focus on the, the surroundings in the background. So you're faster with your camera, you're noticing more things, and that's incredibly important. The other thing is that really um, it changes the whole dynamic of photographing people. Um, it's really helpful if you're nervous about street photography, um, and it's really helpful uh, if you've been doing it for 20 years. It's, it's just a really helpful thing because it, what it does is it allows them to enter your personal space instead of you entering theirs. So you can notice people from further away. You can see who you know is interesting, who might be have a good expression potentially, um, and you can get yourself in position uh, and really allow them to intersect you. Um, without it being too much of a confrontational thing. So this is how I often get really um, close up shots that show a lot of emotion um, without having people really know that I photographed them or anything like that. I just wait around a lot. Um, the second tip, the camera snap is just a super simple thing, but it, it is really important, I think. Um, every, I, nearly everyone I've seen naturally, when they take a photograph they, and they, they click the shutter, they immediately take the camera away from their eye. Um, it's just instinctive. And that's the only way people know that you've taken their photograph, um, unless they hear the shutter, of course. Um, so, you know, if you just don't do that, it really helps you be more candid. Super sneaky, but works really well. So um, I'll just often, you know, I'll take, a lot of times I just kind of, you know, take quick shots and people don't notice. So I'll just, you know, shoot it how I normally do. But when I really want to be candid, you know, maybe I'll take the shot and hold the camera to my eye and let them walk through. Like I was trying to photograph the background and um, they just got in the way. Um, sometimes I'll even, you know, aim up at a building uh, and then move it to the person, take the photograph and then move up at the building. And just the whole thing makes it look like I'm just some, you know, spaced out tourist who maybe doesn't know how to use my camera very well. Uh, and they just happen to be in my way. Um, keep your camera up. Uh, you know, I, I um, with heavier cameras, this can be a little tougher, but when I walk around, I try to keep the camera up higher. I don't like just kind of let it sit on my uh, stomach. Um, as I'm walking around because, you know, when you see something that happens often, they're really quick moments, you know, picking the camera up, uh, it, it takes a little bit more time and it also is a lot more noticeable of emotion. So I'll carry my camera with a prime lens in one hand. I'll often, if I'm tired, like I'll prop the, my, my elbow up with the other hand. Um, and that way the camera's kind of just below my chin, which allows me to kind of, you know, if I need to kind of shoot from the hip without looking, I can quickly shoot like that. Um, or I can just quickly put the camera to my eye and it's not much of a motion. So it, it allows you to be a, a lot more candid by doing it that way. Um, smile or just kind of try to, you know, look as comfortable as you can. Um, that's a really important tip because, you know, no matter what, if you're, you've got a camera there, people notice you. Um, there's no way to be truly candid. And, you know, it's, it's the feeling they get from you. So, you know, if you're kind of it's almost counterintuitive at first. If you're you've got a huge lens and you're kind of hanging all the way back and you're, you know, looking sneaky or a little bit, you know, feeling a little bit nervous, I mean, people are going to notice you. They're going to, they're going to see that no matter if you're far away or, you know, or close up. Um, the way I like to shoot with a prime lens is I kind of often get pretty close and I just act like I, you know, am doing something good and I'm happy and I'm having a great time and I'm just looking around. And um, you find when you do that, you can really, people will like let you you know, do whatever and they won't like really notice you. They'll, they'll see you, but they'll just um, not think twice about you. So it's, it, it is very important to kind of play the part um, that you belong there. Um, walking slow, it's very similar to the linger uh, tip. Uh, if you're a fast walker, just try to take your time. Um, I notice when I work photo with photographers, there are some that always seem like they're trying to get to that next amazing location. And what, by doing that, they miss like, you know, all the stuff along the way. And sometimes it's along the way where you have the best photographs. Um, so, you know, if you find yourself disregarding an area, oh, I can't get any good, good pictures, this area is really boring, or there's nothing here, I think it's even more important to stop yourself and like, just say, you know, wait a minute, is that just me, you know, not noticing things? Or, or is there really no photographs here? Um, so definitely, you know, make sure to stop yourself and, and, and think a little bit um, when you start disregarding areas, um, and what the reason is for that. 
acting is really important. Um, and I just mean subtle acting. You don't have to dress up like a tourist or anything like that. Uh, I really just simply try to make it look like I'm not photographing the people I'm photographing. So, you know, I, I don't look at, look right at people. Um, if I'm trying to be candid, uh, that if you do that, no matter how far, if they're three blocks or four blocks, you know, if they're not three or four blocks, but if they're across the street, you know, if you're staring at someone, they're going to notice you. Um, so just the way you carry yourself, I always kind of make it look like I'm just kind of look like a little spaced out looking at the background. Um, and by doing that, it's just, you play the part, uh, and, and it's, you know, feels totally comfortable to take pictures, even if the people are in the, uh, like walking through. Um, so really that, that subtle acting, um, is incredibly important. Now, what to say if you get caught? Um, it's almost good to have someone stop you and, and catch you because it, it will get your comfort level a lot higher when you figure out like, you know, that you can deal with this in the right way. So what I typically like to say um, is I, I just, I flatter people. I'm just, I say, you know, I'm do oh yeah, I, I took your photograph. I'm doing a project on the streets of New York and you know, the people in the backgrounds. Um, and I thought you just looked uh, fabulous or awesome. Um, you can offer to send them the photograph. If they seem um, uncomfortable, you know, by all means, just, you know, say I didn't mean to make you uncomfortable and, and you know, delete the photograph. Um, you know, legally you don't have to delete the photograph, um, but, you know, it's kind of the nice thing to do. Unless it, you know, happens to be the best photograph of your life, um, in which case just run away, um, you know, do whatever you can to, uh, you know, save that best photograph. Um, but it's never the best photograph of your life when someone stops you. Um, it's often like you're embarrassed if they ask to see it, you know, you're embarrassed to show it to them. It's usually kind of a, a pretty crappy photograph. Now, the final thing um, in this list, uh, a prime lens and a small camera, um, which uh, I told you about a big camera and we'll talk about that later. But I think you can do street photography with any camera. I've done it for a long time with an SLR and a zoom lens. You can do it with an iPhone. Um, you can do it with all types of cameras. But I really think um, you know a lighter camera can help in that it's just quicker to use, and also it allows you to take it with you um, anywhere. You know, it's not just like a, a half a day or a day trek. It's you know you could throw it in you know uh, around your neck or in your bag on the way to the supermarket, or you can leave 15 minutes early for something and just take your time and take a couple photographs. Um, and I think that's really important to the genre. Um, we'll talk about that more later as well. Um, so a small camera helps with that, and a prime lens. Um, I, I'm, I use prime lenses um, exclusively these days. Um, I use 35 millimeter equivalent. Um, 50 millimeter equivalent, uh, and on that GFX, I often use a 40 millimeter uh, equivalent. Um, what the prime lenses do is you just get so used to that focal length that it speeds you up, makes you more spontaneous, um, which is really important. Um, it, it just, you get used to seeing that focal length. And so uh, you know what you're going to get before you even click the shutter. Um, even if, you know, a fast moment happens and, or if you don't feel like, you don't feel comfortable putting it up to your eye, um, when you get used to the prime lens, you can just kind of take the photograph and, and often get it right. Um, and that works really well. Um, and it's, you know, less noticeable to other people, um, which is important. And just as I mentioned, the, the lightness of it uh, really works. So if you have a, a you know, bigger DSLR, um, I would suggest, you know, one of the small pancake lenses that they have. Um, it will just be a completely different um, experience uh, for the genre. Here's one where I'm going to show you a few pictures where, um, you know, if I didn't have my camera, like, you know, in my hands, uh, I did, and I had a pre-focus to a certain distance, which we'll talk about. Um, and I was just kind of ready to take the photograph and he looked down at the last, you know, kind of last few seconds. And I just, you know, saw this great uh, smiley face on his hat. And um, so because I was ready, I was, you know, able to capture it. Um, it was one of those very fast moving uh, photographs. This one is an older photograph with a zoom lens and a, a DSLR. Here's one, um, you know, holidays on Fifth Avenue where it gets just absolutely nuts and crazy and you can barely walk in front of you. And, you know, all of a sudden uh, kind of people parted and I saw just this, you know, incredible look in this uh, young woman's face, you know, it reminds me of almost the most Mona Lisa, which is why I love it so much. Um, you get that kind of half smile, that look in the eyes, um, it's a really powerful expression, but one that, you know, I only could get because I had my camera just ready to go. Now light, um, we'll just talk quickly about light. Um, I mean, I assume you all are very proficient in light, um, but with street photography, it's, you know, um, 
it's a little bit harder than other genres because um, everything's so fast moving. You're going from place to place. You can, you know, be looking one way and see the best moment of your life behind you. And it's a completely different light source. Um, so, you know, typically I tend to, you know, I really focus on looking for interesting moments and interesting people. Um, and I always, when I walk around, I always kind of notice what the light's doing. Um, but getting the light right tends to be more of a, a quick action, trying to do the best I can with, with what I'm given. So things I think about when I walk out the door and, or in, in an area, it's how strong the light is, um, what direction is it coming from, um, how strong is the contrast, and is your main subject in the highlights or shadows. Um, that's in street photography, one thing that can just completely, you know, mess up your photograph. Um, is the light making, making interesting patterns? Um, can that be a great background to photograph or have a person come in? Um, where is the light reflecting? In New York, when you have those big avenues, like Fifth Avenue um, uh, is my favorite one, uh, and the sun is kind of in the middle of the avenue, you just have this great light where if you put the sun behind the people, it reflects off the white pavement and just illuminates their skin and it makes it look like they're almost glowing, um, which is just a great mix with just the opulent Fifth Avenue kind of a feel. Um, so that's always something, you know, I, and I, I try to think about, um, you know, where the light might be reflecting from, um, especially in New York with so many glass buildings or so many things like that. There's a lot of reflections happening. And night, I love to shoot street photography at night. I do it handheld, um, usually with the X100. And I just use really high ISOs. Um, I'm very comfortable, you know, up to 6400 with this camera. And, you know, what I just tend to do is I tend to just look for the light sources and I position myself uh, around where the light is illuminating, you know, where subjects will be. And that allows me to photograph, um, you know, handheld, kind of almost similar, similarly to the, that I would uh, during the day um, at night. So I'll look for um, window displays that have really good colored lighting. And I'll just kind of stand in between that lighting and the subject. And I'll just wait for people to walk by. And it's, it, it creates this absolutely incredible look. Um, and it's really easy to do. This one, I had to wait for uh, a car to come by and just illuminate the foreground here because um, it was so dark. Now, quick on camera settings. Um, I'm assuming you all know your camera settings well, but I'll just kind of explain it how I like to do it for street photography. So there are street photographers that shoot shutter priority, aperture priority, manual, and they all do incredibly well. So they're, you know, if you know it well, um, they all work. I prefer not to use manual for most situations unless the lighting is really consistent because as I mentioned, I mean, especially in New York, but you know, even, you know, when you have two story, you know, buildings, um, there's, you know, always a sh uh, shadow area and there's always um, a sunny area um, unless it's overcast of course, but even then there's, you know, different lighting in different areas. And it's just, you know, you look in different directions and the lighting is completely different. Um, and when I like to shoot this way, I like to just have the camera almost feel like it's not there. It's just me and the subject. And I like to not have to think too hard about um, messing with the camera to get the photograph. You know, I see something, I photograph it. That's, that's I think, the best way to try to do this type of, uh, type of work. So I often, um, I, I usually use aperture priority. I'll start usually when I can around F8. Um, if I'm in like on the beach where it's super sunny or I'm in like bright sun for a very long time, I might go up to F11. Um, and then as it gets darker or from the subway, I'll go all the way down to, you know, F2 or 2.8. Um, and what I do is I just pay attention to my shutter speed and I try to keep my shutter speed above one two fiftieth of a second or one two hundredth of a second is fine as well. If you're above those uh, numbers, you're going to freeze the motion in people and you won't have uh, much of a problem with blur um, unless you want that, of course. At night, I'm fine with going down to 1 one twenty fifth, one eightieth, even 1 sixtieth is fine at night. But during the day, if you want your shots to be sharp, um, 2 fiftieth is kind of my, my base number. So as I walk around, you know, I'll, I'll set my ISO, I'll set my aperture, and I'll just check occasionally as the light changes, just to make sure my, my shutter speed is um, getting that base level consistently. And the most important setting tip is just to raise your ISO up. Uh, in general, I think really high uh, will make your shots a, a lot higher quality for this um, genre. Um, so typically, you know, if I'm on the beach or just in a really sunny area, I'll of course shoot at like 200 or 400. 
But on a sunny day in New York, I'm usually at ISO 800. On an overcast day, I'm 1600. And then from dusk into evening, I'm 32 or 6400. Um, the newer cameras, cameras in the last you know five, six, seven years, um, can do really well at higher ISOs. Most of them, not all of them. Um, you know, there's going to be more grain, of course, but um, typically in the newer cameras, it looks really good. It doesn't look too bad. Um, and by having um, a faster shutter speed, more depth of field, your shots are going to be sharper in general, and so that's going to offset you know any any problems that having more grain might might cause. Um, but I know a lot of street photographers that just, you know, even, even during the day when they don't have to, they'll shoot everything at 1600 because they just love the look of grain uh, for this genre. So it depends on, you know, how you like the look. Um, and then large versus small depth of field. Um, I love seeing street photography that shot with a shallow depth of field. Um, I love, you know, you get the subject in the blurred background, it looks beautiful. But for me, it, it doesn't really practically work to shoot that way just because you never know what you're gonna get. Um, and the first thing is just your focusing. If you, if you don't have to be, if it's not night or you don't have to be on like F2.8, um, you can, if you can be on F8, you know, if you miss the focus with a fast moving scene in F2.8, you're gonna often screw up the shot. If you're at F8, um, particularly with a wider angle lens, um, you're gonna, you know, often still get the shot uh, even if you miss the focus a bit. Um, so it really kind of takes the, it takes a lot of the mistakes um, out of the equation. Um, and also, there are many scenes where you can have multiple subjects coming together, you know, different depths, a great subject or great background, and you want all that stuff to be sharp. And you just, you don't know when that, uh, that scene is going to happen. You just, you don't know when, when all those things are going to come together. And if you're, you're stuck on F2.8 when you don't have to be, uh, you know, so some of those things that you want to be sharp are really going to be blurry. Um, so really, F8 is usually my kind of uh, default, and I kind of go from there. Here's a photograph. Um, <clears throat> this is uh, in Soho, uh, the first area that was looted in New York during uh, all that craziness, um, the Louis Vuitton store, which I shoot outside of all the time. And this guy just, he saw me taking this photograph and he laughed and he just yelled at me. He said, uh, you know, don't show my mama, um, which I thought was funny. But, uh, you know, if you see here, this, like he's sharp, this is all sharp right here. Um, you know, there's so much going on here, uh, but it just helps to have a, a decent depth of field here. Um, you can even, you can see the grain kind of in here um, and in here, um, but it looks great. It doesn't really matter. Similar shot, you know, easy to get um, with a large, uh, large numbered aperture here, easy to get everything in focus. Um, now the important question, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm getting a little hoarse. What makes an interesting photograph? I have no idea. So the, uh, the, that's the thing that um, I think when you start to figure out what you find interesting, um, that's when I think you become on the path towards becoming a good street photographer. Um, I like <clears throat> work that's personal in that um, it's something that you like. Um, a lot of the most interesting photographs, I think, in the genre maybe don't stand out. You know, so a, lot, a lot of the best ones stand out, of course, but a lot of them don't stand out the first time you look at them. A lot of them don't stand out unless you have, you know, a whole series of images that have a similar feel and you're trying to, you know, put together a story or a feeling. Um, and so, you know, it's some of the best photographs, you know, maybe you put on Instagram or you share it and people won't get it or may, maybe not like it at first. Um, that doesn't mean it's a bad photograph. Uh, it's really important to what it means to you first. And then it's also important to understand how other people perceive it, of course. Um, but I think you really need to start to develop, um, you know, your personal taste and what you like. And, you know, this is a kind of a shooting. We'll talk a little bit about editing. This is a, a shooting presentation. Uh, I love to edit. Um, and I think editing is where, you know, when you take the photographs, you really start to put together um, your voice. When you start doing this type of work, you're going out and you're, a lot of people, ask, you know, you just try to get the most interesting person you can see sharp and a good photograph. Um, and that's how you start. Uh, and then over time, you start to notice consistencies within those photographs that relate to you. You know, maybe, you know, you're a brooding person and you've got some, you know, you're really attracted to kind of uh, people who have these kind of brooding looks or, you know, maybe there's certain feelings that, that, that you're more attracted to when you're walking around or certain ideas. Um, and through editing, you know, I use collections in Lightroom and I just, I, I think of ideas and I drag the photographs into those collections and they change over time. 
Um, and it's really fun to go through your work and find the photographs that, uh, you know, they may be disparate, but there's some connection uh, between the two. Uh, and the, the connection is you. Um, so that's when I think that you start to really kind of develop your work and your voice. Um, if you're uh, familiar with, um, you know, Robert Frank and the Americans, um, he loved to photograph different uh, items of Americana. So he photographed a ton of jukeboxes, a ton of um, flags. Uh, and so this is not necessarily Americana, this is all over the world. But, um, you know, one thing I'm fascinated about, obviously it's everywhere, is just um, the coffee cup, uh, the cell phone, the shopping bag, and headphones. And it's almost like a suit of armor that everyone's carrying all day when they walk around, um, different from what it was here 15, 20 years ago. Um, the headphones particularly, I mean, the, the, the cell phone as well. Um, but, you know, the beauty of a, a place like New York ha has always been, and it still is, um, it's uh, the random connections you get from people of completely different backgrounds. And, and um, just by walking out on the street, uh, you never know what you're going to get um, or who you're going to bump into or what experience you're going to have. And now you're seeing a lot of people just lost in headphones. Um, and it's taking out that whole equation of the spontaneity of what you know, might happen by just being aware of your surroundings um, and who you might interact with. Uh, so I, I really find headphones to be a fascinating uh, change in, in New York, um, particularly the big ones as they took over. So while I said I don't know, <clears throat> excuse me again. <coughs> just get that out. Well, while I said I don't know what makes an interesting photograph, um, there are, <clears throat> excuse me, there we go. Um, I, there are some things that uh, I think can make a photograph more interesting. So there are things to really um, pay attention to. The first is content and story. Um, you know, it can be a, an actual story that you think about and an idea and you put together. Um, it can be a, a feeling in your work. Um, it can be an underlying, you know, something beneath the surface, um, which is uh, number four on the list. Um, just something to the photograph that's more than just, you know, the what's on the surface, the beauty of the photograph. There's something else underneath. Um, emotion and gesture, as I talked about, um, looks and eyes, looks and faces, um, gestures and bodies. Um, I would rather the most indescript person um, uh, to photograph them with a really powerful expression and, and feeling on their face than the flashiest, most standout person uh, without any emotion to them. Um, so when I'm, walk when I'm looking around, I'm looking for people who have their emotions on their shoulders, so to speak. And then you look for that and then you try to get it together with the form, the light, color, tone, and composition. Um, and when you mix the two in the right way, I think that's when you get those really magical photographs that, that you're like, how the hell did I get that? Those are the ones that you get. The more, the more time you spend out there doing this, they come uh, when they come. Um, and looking beneath the surface. So just something you can't really describe what it is, um, but something that makes you think. Um, some of my favorite photographs, you know, you look at it over time and, and you know, maybe you'll feel different about it based on uh, how you're feeling that day or something. You know, maybe you'll see something different uh, the 10th time looking at it than the first. Um, so that, that can be important for some of the photographs, not all of them, uh, of course. Consistency. Um, consistency is a really interesting thing to talk about in street photography. So, you know, often people think about consistency as the look of the photographs. Um, I think it's different. So, you know, I've, I've, there's a lot of amazing photographers that have shot projects in color and projects in black and white, um, different types of cameras and lenses, um, uh, even different subjects. And the consistency is you. Um, the over time, I think the photographs, no matter what they're taken with, you can start. You can you can still tell who the photographer is um, if you know that photographer. Um, and so the consistency is is your point of view, and developing that is is really important. And just interpretation and ambiguity for some of the photographs. Um, some are going to be great and obvious. Um, but some, some of them, and, and, you know, maybe if you're telling a story, leave as, you know, leave some up to interpretation, uh, let people think about how they feel about the photographs in the story. Here's a photograph with, uh, I think it's 36 different devices in it. Now imperfection, um, that's, a, it's a really important, uh, idea in street photography. Um, and, you know, often work with some photographers, uh, you know, who come from landscape or portrait backgrounds and, you know, trying to get everything perfect. 
you know, getting annoyed if you cut off someone's foot or, you know, something's a little off. With street photography, we want the interesting moments and it's great if it just feels like it's a special unplanned caught moment. And because of that, um, you know, there's a lot more flexibility than in other genres. So I'll just read this. Uh, a street photograph does not have to be perfect to be good. The nature of a good street photograph gives us a glimpse into a slice of reality and perfection can ruin this feeling because life isn't perfect. Um, this is why grain, angled horizons, cut off people or slightly out of focus or motion blur are all very common in street photography. Um, sometimes imperfections will like certainly ruin a photograph, um, but other times they'll make it that much better. Um, it, you never really know when you're shooting it, um, but you know, please don't be so hard on yourself if you screwed up something that, um, you know, you didn't want to screw up when you're shooting it. Um, give, you know, it's, I've seen some of the, my favorite street photographs are, are blurry, you know, if you look at it. Um, if you look at the work of Gary Winogrand, uh, you know, probably the most famous New York street photographer, so much of his work was shot, and he did this, I think, purposely or, you know, instinctively, they were shot off kilter. And it just gives it the diagonals, it creates an energy to the photographs, um, and it makes it feel, the imperfection makes it feel uh, more real. Here's a photograph of a butt selfie, someone taking a butt selfie. Um, if you stand in the corner for long enough time, you'll, you'll see everything. Um, but if you see here, you know, the highlights are blown out. Um, it's not the sharpest photograph in the world. There's, you know, it's really grainy. It definitely, it's a crop of a larger picture. Um, but, you know, it's a really interesting moment. I think it looks beautiful despite all that stuff. Here's another, um, you know, blurry photograph. I was walking around kind of at dusk and I didn't stop myself um, enough, uh, with enough time to um, get it perfectly sharp. Um, but I think it makes it look even more painterly and it just happens to work really well. Um, it definitely, you know, highlights the cigarette here and this, you know, great facial expression. Now combining elements. Um, this is just an important thing to think about, not for every photograph, but for some. Um, when I work with some photographers, uh, I know some people have a little bit of a tunnel vision where they'll just notice the main subject over and over and just photograph them, um, which is a great thing to do for some of the photographs, um, but it's really important to see the surroundings as well and often to try to capture those surroundings um, or maybe to keep a, you know, an eye on if other people are walking into the scene or in the scene and, and trying to put it all together. Um, this is for some situations, not all, but uh, when it works, it really works. So here's um, a portrait I was, I was uh, doing of this young woman and waiting uh, you know, for her to maybe not know that I was necessarily taking a photograph at that moment. So she took a break and, and looked down and, and went and thought. And then I noticed this other uh, young woman walking down the street with coffee cups um, and just combined the two. When I do group workshops, I often give uh, a contest of who can photograph someone with the most, carrying the most coffee cups. Um, and one person actually within five minutes of walking out the door the first day, uh, got, took a photograph of someone um, carrying eight, eight coffee cups uh, and that's never been beat. Uh, so it's, it's a hard number to beat. Here's a photograph way back from uh, Occupy Wall Street uh, where I think each of, these, each of these parts of the photograph would be great on their own, but the combination of the two I think brings it all together. Now setting a stage, um, and this is a tricky one because sometimes it's a really good thing to do and sometimes I think it's actually uh, can ruin your photograph. So if I see a lot of people, they see a really wonderful background, fantastic background, and they, they just wait for any person to come by to enter the scene and photograph that person with the background. And often that person is just, you know, I think taking away from the background. Um, so. If you see a good background, you know, think about whether that's the photograph entirely right there. Um, if you're going to have a person come in and stand up to a really great background, I think the person has to really fit or really look great or, or stand up to it in a certain way. Um, so don't think that you just have to wait for any person to walk into the scene to suddenly make it a street photograph. Um, the background on its own can, can be a, uh, its own photograph.
here's one where I was trying for, I don't know, like a decade to get a, a non cheesy photograph of that New York steam that, that comes out. Um, and I love bike messengers. So I was trying to get a good photograph of a bike messenger and I, I hadn't had anything that I really liked for, um, for a while. And then suddenly I got this great photograph of the two of them together. Um, and I never have to take a photograph of steam or bike messengers ever again. Uh, so I got that out of my system. Here's uh, four photographs, um, which I think are interesting sh to show together. Um, this is my favorite corner in, in uh, New York to photograph. It's the corner of Prince and Broadway in Soho, um, right where the looting happened uh, um, during all the craziness. Um, so it's interesting because I was originally here to pho photograph just the background. I loved how this looked, the lighting, the colors, um, the shoes and, and the mannequin and stuff. Um, and then this great guy walked into the scene and because I was just hanging out there and just photographing and, and doing my own thing and looking different ways, um, he just let me be, he didn't even give me two, you know, uh, two thoughts. So it allowed me to, you know, take a bunch of photographs. Um, there, there's a lot more, but to still be, you know, polite and candid about it. Um, and so, you know, think about which ones, you know, I like the best. Um, I think the first one or the third one are my, my personal favorites. Um, this one I wanted, you know, I took a bunch that were really crazy and I, I wanted it to work out because it's got these great, all these great different elements, but I think it just doesn't come together quite well. Um, so, you know, I love this guy in here. I think he adds to it, but at the same time, I love this background on its own. Um, so, uh, you know, this might actually be my favorite photograph on the left, um, but this one is great as well, depending on the circumstance. Now color black and white, um, obviously it's a personal preference. Uh, there's no rhyme or there's no uh, better way to, to shoot. Um, I think it's important though for consistency and particularly for projects or stories. There are photographers who I've seen who have mixed color and black and white in, in projects and, and books and it's looked incredible. Um, so it, you can definitely do that. Um, I have not found a way to make it work for my own work. It's really hard to make that work, um, I think, but when you do it, it's, it's pretty special. Um, so I think, you know, keeping consistent, a consistent look for some sort of project, it really can focus the work um, and focus your viewer as they're looking through your images. Now, black and white, of course, has a, a timeless quality to it, um, while color um, often can have... Um, a more modern quality, uh, although newer cameras now have these great color presets um, where they mimic the look of old film. So now color can tend to feel more nostalgic and have this great look. Um, but I often flip that whole idea on its head and I love to photograph modern um, things in black and white uh, because it makes something that so, you're so used to seeing these days and it takes it out of its context and makes it feel like it's a, it's a historic photograph and it makes you think about it a little bit more. Faces, um, which are really important to street photography, I think often they stand out a lot more in black and white than in color. There's less distractions. Um, so I think a good photograph of a face or multiple faces um, can often look a lot better if you put in black and white, uh, but that's not a steadfast rule. Um, and of course, color distractions can um, frequently ruin photographs and just the way to fix it is to turn the photograph into black and white. Here's a photograph. I just love the disconnect between, um, you know, the muted colors of this young woman and, and the kind of the stiffness in the pose and then the iPhone uh, cover of kind of this, you know, flowing person with this red dress. Um, I thought that was interesting. Here's one that uh, taken at a famous basketball court, Rucker Park. Um, this great kid uh, and he, you know, waited for him to look up um, and look me right in the eyes. Uh, and so that kind of made the photograph. Um, this was one where I actually got contacted by Nike, who was like, we'd love to use this image for an ad campaign. And I was like, I took this photograph 10 years ago. Um, there's no way I can go back and find a, a model release of this kid. Um, but I knew, I know some photographers, Jay Mizell's one who got like a big commission based on a photograph. And he went back to the street and just like papered the area with the photograph, trying to find the person and eventually actually did find the person. Um, and this actually brings up an interesting, uh, and tough conversation about, you know, photographing kids in, in street photography. Um, it's, uh, it's an important thing to talk about, um, but there's, I don't have an answer to the, the question of whether to, or not to photograph kids. Um, if you look at the history of street photography, that, and uh, particularly back when, you know, cameras were seen as, you know, when you saw someone with a camera on the street, you know, it was a more special thing. 
Um, there was, you know, wasn't as much thought of, uh, you know, everyone having cameras and stuff like that. So, uh, like a third, of, you know, or, or more of the most amazing historical street photographs are of, of kids. Um, it's it's just you know amazing what you can see and what you can photograph. Um, and I know fo fo photographers who won't photograph kids. I know photographers who will photograph everything. They think it's important to photograph like everything that you know they see. Um, I personally like you know, obviously the moment has to be tasteful. Um, you can see from the few photographs there, either, you know, were tasteful moments. Um, I, I will photograph um, kids. I'll either do it like very obviously um, where, you know, I just, you know, it's just so obvious that uh, it's, um, you know, can't be doing anything wrong. It's, you know, a tasteful moment, something like that, or, you know, quick moments. If it's a, if it's a tasteful thing, I'll take a quick shot and, and move on. Um, but anything borderline, anything, you know, I don't take any mediocre photographs or anything. I'm just like, not, this is amazing. Um, Cause you can get, you know, in, in trouble, people can get really angry at you and, and, and it, it can be a tough thing. Um, uh, and so it's just, you know, it's definitely a personal preference, but you do really have to be aware of yourself um, if you decide to, to photograph kids. Um, and obviously, you know, it's important to make the photographs uh, tasteful. This is a photograph that um, I, I love in color for obvious reasons, but um, it's uh, part of a project that I'll talk about a little bit later called Lux City, um, which is an all black and white project. So I have to put it in black and white for that project. And it still looks great, um, but you know, it's often a bummer that you have to kind of you know, take away the color and something like this. Um, and we can take a, like a quick, um, a quick second. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and we can do some questions if anyone has. Um, so I'm going to stop the share real quick. And so if anybody um, has any questions, just unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask and just uh, make sure to mute yourself again after, um, yeah, uh, after we finish the question. So does anybody have any questions? James? Yep. Uh, you were talking about camera settings. Have you ever used manual mode with uh, auto ISO? <laughs> I have not, but that is also um, a great way to do it. Um, and just because I don't shoot that way, I often forget to just talk about it in, in the presentation. Um, but yeah, there are photographers who do that. Uh, I think as long as you're as long as you're um, controlling two of the settings, uh, it, you know, it works great. Um, and some photographers will set the maximum and minimum ISO, so you know, it can go between four hundred and sixteen hundred, and you know, that can still work well as well. Also, yeah. Um, I, I see one. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah, I wondered in, in terms of composition, do you shoot, you, do you compose and shoot or do you crop to compose afterwards? You know, I try to get it as perfect as possible as I can. Um, you know, some of the photographs, I'll pick a background and I'll set it all up and, you know, take that or wait for a person to come in. Um, but, you know, so many of the best photographs just kind of, hit you like quickly and you can only, especially with a prime lens, you can only do what you can do. Um, so I'm, I'm fine with cropping. Um, that, yeah, it's not a problem. Uh, I just, I'm more about, uh, you know, whatever I can do to get to the best end point. Um, but really it's like, you know, I, I, I try as hard as I can to, to get it as good as possible in the camera. Yep. James. Yep. What would you guess is your ratio of black and white photos to color photos? So, you know, I would say up until two years ago, it was 70, 30 black and white to color. And the last two years, it's probably um, 70, 30 color to black and white. Um, and it's based on switching a project, which I'll talk more about, um, and purposely deciding to shoot that project in color, whereas I finished a few projects that I was doing in black and white. Um, so I, I wanted to, you know, I like to kind of get myself off of my comfort level. If I'm doing, you know, I was doing black and white mostly for a long time. Um, and I just, you know, said, I got to, you know, switch it up and I want to really try some, uh, try a project in color. So. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, you. Uh... Hello. 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 Yep. Okay, you uh, you told us that uh, 
it was legal in the US and the UK. Mm -hmm. Is, it, is yeah. it legal in the Canada? That's a good question. And I'm sorry, I actually should have looked that up before this, but I, I did not think to. Um, I do, uh, you know, no Canadian photographers, uh, street photographers who do this type of work. And I don't seem, they don't seem to be con concerned. Oh, whoops. Hold on. Sorry. Sorry about that. Um, and they don't seem to have issues. Uh, but yes, I, I apologize. I should have actually looked into the legal laws before that. Um, right. But I, ha I haven't, um, like certain countries like Germany, um, there are street photographers who like, you know, and even though the laws are stricter there, there are street photographers in Germany who just shoot normally. But there are ones who like, you know, they really have a style that is based on showing the backs of people um, or backgrounds more, things like that. Yeah, thanks. Yep. As far as I know, it, it's and legal I'm, to shoot in public places. Okay, so I'm reading this from the law in Canada. Mm -hmm. The situation in Canada has reached the point where it needs to be said loudly and clearly. There is no law against public photography in Canada. No one here can ever be arrested for the simple act of taking a picture or film unless other laws are being broken in the process. So that's your answer. Yep. Okay. So that, yeah, that sounds exactly the same as um, the U.S. If you're on public property, uh, you can photograph. Um, often, I, I know people who have you know gotten into confrontations, and they they always hold hold their ground. And um, if if you do get into a confrontation with someone about it, um, you know, I think it's best to just you know not try to get into a fight with a person because I, I, it's uh, you know even though you're in the right, just you know explain it and you know move on. Um, uh, and there is the issue of like interior spaces. Um, and it's, 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 you know, legally, um, you know, you're not really allowed to take street photography on private spaces unless you have the, um, uh, unless the person who owns the place, you know, says you can. But uh, if you look at most like really well-known street photographers, they shoot on interiors as well. Um, and have not had a problem because of that. Uh, so even though, you know, it, it technically can be an issue, um, you know, I have not seen it be an issue. So it's just, that's just something to know. Don't uh, take that as legal advice, of course. Um, anybody else have a question? It did, it did go on to say that if you are, um, that it's legal for many public space, but that if you are asked by a security guard or the police to cease taking pictures because you could be on a public space but you might be taking pictures of something on a private space so if a security guard or the police ask you to stop that you're you are to stop okay so that's that's um the u.s is a little different in that uh um you can photograph any private spaces from public property um, legally. So if, you know, if security guard, you know, obviously can't get in the way of police, but, uh, you know, um, security guards here often, um, yeah, I've heard, I haven't had an issue with a security guard, but, you know, I will tell people you can't photograph here. And uh, really that's, that's not the truth in the U.S. I did have an issue when I was uh, working for an engineering firm. My boss wanted me to take pictures of the GO station where we had actually done the engineering and overseen the building of the uh, canopies and that. And uh, so we were on public space and I was uh, taking pictures and uh, they came over and they held us until, and my boss didn't have his ID on him. He'd left it in the truck. I didn't bother to bring my purse because I was with my boss. <laughs> and so until my boss could prove who we were, they weren't going to let us go. Wow. Yeah, so take your ID and a business card. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, okay, if nobody has any questions right now. Oh, and I don't know if you heard that, but. Yep. I've, been, I've been stopped from photographing from the street into a casino in Las Vegas. Um, as, yeah, it's still as, uh, as long as um, where you're standing isn't actually their property. Uh, you know, maybe we're, may, I don't know if, were you standing on just a sidewalk or? I was on the sidewalk outside. Okay. Uh, yeah, that, that was just, you know, maybe they're, they're, they're told to not, you know, you're not allowed to do that, but you're, you are. 
Well, they don't want people who's uh, people. They don't want people who are there enjoying themselves with someone else's husband or wife or girlfriend being <laughs> published. I guess that's the whole idea. <laughs> For sure. That's a, uh, I have a funny story of a friend of mine who was photographing in Paris and she took this great photograph of uh, someone carrying flowers uh, down the street and she went up to them and said, Oh, I got this great photograph. Like, check it out. Um, can I send it to you? And he looked at it and said, you know, this is a, a beautiful photograph. Um, but I, I'd appreciate it if you wouldn't, because these flowers aren't for my wife. Um, so. <laughs> okay, so if, uh, we can do uh, some more questions at the end if anybody has, uh, but I'll share my screen again. Um, so uh, street photography without people, uh, as um, you know, I've talked a little bit about, uh, it's the, the difference between like, I think an urban landscape photograph and a street photograph without people is just the intent of it. Uh, you know, urban landscapes, and I take a lot of these, um, the intent is just to take the most beautiful photograph that you can. Um, that's, that's the ultimate goal. The, obviously, for street uh, photographs, you want them to look beautiful. But the goal, I think, is there's, there's, a, there's another goal. The goal is to share some idea or feeling or tone in your work. Um, so I think that's the difference between the two. Uh, there's obviously a lot of borderline and gray areas where, you know, what is actually a street photograph and what's an urban landscape. Um, but the intent uh, is, is, I think, um, what makes the difference. So um, this photograph, uh, looking down Sixth Avenue, um, really kind of shows, you know, how domineering New York can feel. And uh, for me, it gives me that kind of that feeling, that that you know, pace, that stress, that anxiety um, in this, uh, similar to uh, this photograph. Here, if you've uh, read about the uh, or seen the um, uh, new Hudson Yards um, project that was recently completed uh, in New York, it's basically this just completely new luxury uh, neighborhood built over an old train yard. It's like eight or nine just giant glass skyscrapers. Um, it's uh, architecturally uh, extremely hated um, uh, in the city. Um, and this photograph, it's just kind of this dystopian feeling place when you walk around. It's really, it's really strange, um, but it's impressive. And so this photograph was kind of my way of, you know, you know, showing all this incredible architecture. But um, just really, you look at the photograph and you, you see nothing. You know, it's almost like a bright blank white photograph, um, despite there being so much in it. Here's the photograph of the side of a Harry Winston store in um, uh, on Fifth Avenue, uh, and just kind of when I was talking about, you know. And one of the special things about New York is just, you know, how it, it's forever had its own kind of flavor, its own, own, own thing to it. And as time goes on, you're seeing a lot of uh, just conformity and similarities happening between New York and, you know, uh, major places around the world. Now, this tip um, I think is really important, but uh, it just needs a little bit more explaining. So use your eyes instead of the viewfinder. Um, all of the work is done with your eyes, um, so it's important to train them. And so this isn't talking about hip shooting, shooting without looking through the viewfinder, um, which I definitely do uh, a, a fair percentage of the time um, when I can't bring the camera to my eyes. But, you know, I do see people when they photograph, they get their, the camera, like they stick their head in the camera and look at the viewfinder and they keep it there. Um, and that really can limit your vision. Um, so I like to see the moment happening or about to happen with my eyes first, and then I bring the camera up and shoot it. Um, and I think that makes me really quick and aware and it allows me to see multiple subjects and um, things changing. Uh, so definitely, uh, I think it's important to, to try to see something with your eyes before you photograph it uh, for this genre. Now, uh, zone focusing. Um, zone focusing is something that's, it, it's not too bad to explain it um, in a presentation, but it's really easy to, to kind of show uh, if you're standing next to a person with your camera. Um, half the time I will use center point focusing and I'll just lock it on and recompose and take the photograph and half the point I'll zone focus, um, which basically means manual focusing your camera and setting pre-setting it to a certain distance that you typically photograph in. I typically set it between eight and 10 feet uh, in normal circumstances. If I'm on the subway, I'm, because you're in, in, in more enclosed situations, I might do you know, five to seven feet. Um, and what that does is it just um, allows you to not have to waste the time to lock on 
uh, the autofocus, um, which can really slow you down or screw up the photograph, you know, and screw up the composition in a fast moving scene. And the way to do this well is it really works with a wide angle lens. Um, I mostly do it with a 35 millimeter and sometimes do it with a 50 millimeter, um, but I think 35 is, is ideal for it. And if you're shooting, you know, I'll, I'll I mean, I, I still will zone focusing, zone focus at f2.8 when I need to with a shallow depth of field, but I much prefer with a decent depth of field, like with an f8. And if you think about it, if you're pre-focused to nine feet away from the camera, um, something or something like, you know, 2.7 to three meters or something like that, if you um, have an F8 and a wide angle lens, uh, 35 millimeter lens, you know, everything from five feet to 15 feet is gonna be pretty in focus. Um, you know, obviously as you go further out, it'll be a little bit less in focus, but really that frees you up because um, you know that, you know, that main area where you're gonna be photographing anyway, that's street photography is usually between five and 15 feet, um, is gonna be sharp. So it just takes focusing completely out of the equation. Um, and it just allows you to just, when I say, see the scene and take the photograph and not worry about your camera, um, it really allows you to do that. So it takes a, a few days to get used to it. Um, you know, you, hit, you sometimes will hit the, the focusing wheel and, and take a shot when you don't, it, you know, maybe you'll knock it up to 30 feet away by accident without noticing. And um, you'll definitely screw up some shots sometimes. Um, but when you get uh, used to doing it, um, it's, uh, I find it to be a much easier way to get sharp shots than autofocusing. Um, so it's a great thing. Here's a photograph of uh, two people who bumped into each other and, and just this uh, man started screaming immediately at this um, woman. And it was just a split second shot that I took it. I was, you know, um, just looking around this corner. This is the same corner that I mentioned I love to photograph on. And, you know, if you think about it, you know, the split second moments allowed me to take a quick shot and get it. But if I had been autofocusing, there's no way I would have been able to get this photograph because I would have back focused it here. Um, or if I quickly tried to lock on the center point here or here, um, you know, that would have been the wrong composition. Um, so it really freed me up to take exactly the photograph I needed to take um, very quickly. Here's one, uh, Robert Frank has um, what I think is the most amazing crowd photograph I've ever seen uh, taken on Canal Street. Um, and I love to photograph on Canal Street, so this is also on Canal. And I've been, you know, trying for a long time to get an incredible crowd shot that, you know, I was proud of um, and, you know, in, probably 10 years of trying this. I have a couple that I like. Uh, this is the one that I like the most. And, you know, the only way I could get this was just pre-focusing. You know, in this case, I didn't, I didn't use manual focusing. I, I auto-focused and I picked the point, uh, you know, somewhere here where I knew was the middle of the scene and I turned the autofocus off. Um, and then it allowed me to just kind of watch the people and hold the camera up and I had the background that I loved. Um, and so by doing that, I could shoot quickly. I could just watch the people and it allowed me really to get lucky and to, you know, capture a photograph where, you know, there's a great face, you know, in every little piece of the scene. How will an image age is something that's important to think about. Um, just, you know, you never know how it's gonna age, but it's just an, a question that I think uh, really makes you to try to not take certain things for granted. Um, I think, you know, I don't know if you're, uh, who's familiar with the wor work of William Eggleston, but, you know, early on William Eggleston, you know, was worried, you know, was, uh, you know, worried that, you know, he was, in, he was shooting in Mississippi um, and Memphis and, you know, he was worried that, you know, his, he was trying to do this type of work that all these great street photographers at the time in New York were doing. And, you know, he was thinking, oh, these areas feel more boring for this type of work. And, you know, a, a friend told him, said, uh, you know, why don't you photograph what you, you know, find to be so, you know, boring or so quiet? Why don't you, you why don't you focus on that? Um, and the most incredible body of work kind of came out of that, just that little switch. Um, so I think that's all important stuff to think about. Now, something like cell phone photographs, I love to photograph them, but because you see them everywhere, um, you know, they're kind of a dime a dozen almost. And so what it means is it doesn't mean that cell phone photographs aren't interesting uh, because I think they're, they're fascinating. Um, it just means that you have to get a really good cell phone a photograph of people staring at their cell phones for it to stand out. Um, so, you know, I have a few that I like now. Um, uh, but yeah, that's just something to think about. Here's a photograph of someone else's graffiti, um, but uh, this is a kind of a glue image for um, the Lux City project I was mentioning. Um, so I, I love the message that it uh, talks about. 
um, the uh, you'll notice that the um, images have become more black and white or all black and white as I've gone on here. Um, so these photographs are all part of um, a project, the project Lux City. And the idea of the project is um, the changing nature of New York uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, particularly um, as uh, people have realized, you know, how safe New York, uh, you know, has become. And kind of a lot of, you know, a lot of wealthy people who had, you know, escaped the city in the 70s and 80s have started coming back. Um, the, the nature of the city uh, in many places is, is starting to change. You're seeing a lot more luxur luxurification, a lot more consumption, consumerism, um, and just things that come with that. Uh, and in terms of people, you're seeing a lot of, you know, more loneliness, uh, different, not more stress or more anxiety, but a different type of stress and a different type of anxiety, uh, and just looks in people's faces and things like that, uh, more loneliness. Um, so that's kind of generally what the, the project is uh, attempting to show. And uh, right here it says, uh, talk to me because I'm lonely. And you know, I started, when I started shooting this project, you know, maybe 10-ish years ago, I didn't know what I was shooting. I um, just over time found images that I liked and I started putting together. Um, and you know, over that period of time, I also became really interested in um, reading about the city and the issues of gentrification and um, the change. And so I followed all these different writers and um, just it was uh, a topic that I've been really fascinated on. And so this project developed simultaneously as I was doing that learning. Um, and maybe five years in, I really could put words to it. Uh, and as it spiraled, I started knowing what I was photographing and really starting to come back uh, with more photographs over time than I, than I did, did initially. But there's you know, two ways to create projects. One is um, typically how I do it is you know, pick an area um, and I'll just go out and start photographing. Uh, I love the walk. That's how I love, why I love the genre. Um, and over time, I'll pick out the photographs and, and start to put together an idea or start to put together a project. But there are other photographers who just think of an amazing idea right away and they go out and photograph it. Um, and that's a great way to do things as well. Now, editing, um, as I mentioned, I love using collections. And I really try to you know, get the different projects to have a, a consistency between them. So when you're looking through, um, you know, I, tr I try to keep the crops the same, um, native to the camera, um, the general tones uh, similar. So it's just a consistent experience. Um, and, and that's the way I like to do it. I think it, it focuses the viewer. Um, but as I've mentioned before, I, uh, there are, photographers do it completely differently and they mix everything up and, and they found a way to look great. Um, here's a photograph where I've been trying to get like a, a great photograph of someone vape smoking with those big clouds for a long time. And I, this is, you know, after trying for a long time, this is the one I've been looking for for a long time. And just, you know, through the editing process, like, you know, looking at these ones that were not quite there or almost there, you know, I kept saying, oh, I, I, you know, I can get something better maybe if I get lucky. And, you know, finally I saw this moment. Um, Here's a photograph of a, a sample sale in Soho. Um, people waiting online uh, with job interviews. This is why you shouldn't visit New York in holiday time. The rest of the year is great. Weird and different images. Um, as I mentioned, uh, this type of work, it's, it's good to know how people think about it, but do it for yourself. A lot of people aren't going to relate to a lot of the images, um, particularly if they see it as a one-off on an Instagram feed or uh, something like that. Um, they'll relate to it much better in a consistent uh, portfolio of work. and embrace spontaneity. Um, go with your gut. Uh, you know, the, the, the 
keeper rate for this genre is is pretty low, um, and it's good to just not show those bad photographs um, unless you're you know, obviously looking for advice. Um, you know, really, if I feel that um, like a photograph might be happening, I'll take the photograph. Um, over time, you know, I've gotten to the point where often I'll get ready to take the photograph and pull back at the last minute. But um, you know, I'd rather you just kind of go with your gut and, and edit it out later. When I do edit and I put pull, uh, call in the photographs. I'll like immediately go through and I'll give zero stars, three stars and five stars. And I'll just delete the zero stars and get rid of them um, just to keep the archive uh, smaller. Here's one that was just, they came around the corner and because I was pre-focused and all that, as I mentioned, uh, I was able to get, you know, a really quick shot with the great um, eye expressions. Now the final section, is just gonna talk about real quick, um, this new project I've been working on for the last couple of years. And so I finished, almost finished the, the uh, two projects that, that I was doing, Lux City and one that was you know, pretty similar idea. And you know, I moved to Brooklyn, a quieter area from Manhattan. And I said, I, I wanted to shoot in a completely different way. I wanted to you know, slow down a little bit, get the anxiety out of my photography, um, photograph, at just explore deep areas of more suburban Brooklyn um, and get to know them just by walking with a camera. And it's interesting, um, you know, there's a lot, obviously a lot more backgrounds, but people are, are a big part of it, or I'm trying to get people to be a big part of it as well. And I really had this, you know, feeling when I started to do it that was uncomfortable. And, you know, it just, the way I shot in Manhattan where you could blend in with a small camera, it just didn't feel like it, was quite right for me. Um, it, other people do it and it's fine, but it, it, it felt a little kind of almost sneaky and, uh, and I just, I felt a little uncomfortable. And I saw this quote from Alex Soth, um, who, you know, is one of my favorite photographers. And, you know, he said that, you know, he uses a large format camera and does a lot of portraits and um, uh, he did the great project uh, in Niagara Falls. And um, he, people just let him into their worlds. Like they'll take them into their house. They'll, you know, just show them interesting things and this great like expressions and, and intimate photographs. And he said that just having this large format camera made what he did seem so special because of the camera that it really people saw him saw what he did as legitimate and they they allowed themselves to open up. Um, you know, a lot of you know photographers these days. It's you know if you're trying to do that, you really have to, you know be a good talker, talk to people, explain what you're doing and stuff like that. But a large format camera in that case helped him significantly. And so I just thought that, you know, maybe uh, in these areas, I'd feel more comfortable with a bigger camera. I'd feel more like I belonged. And, and so I do sh sometimes shoot candidly when I need to for certain photographs. Um, but the bigger uh, camera just makes me feel like and seem like I belong more in the area. Um, and I, I think uh, I, 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 I mean, it seems to, you know, have a different perception when I'm walking around with the camera in these areas than I did with the smaller camera. But most importantly, I feel more comfortable and the way I kind of shoot, I think works uh, well with that. The other reason why I love the medium format is because it's, you know, a, a project with a lot more color and, and backgrounds and things, the details are really important. And so I wanted the, um, the color that comes out of the camera to really work. Um, and, and I wanted to be able to show the details all throughout the photograph uh, when I can. Um, so that's why I kind of chose this camera. Um, but just something important to think about is how you view the world in the areas that you're capturing as you're photographing. It's just something important to keep in the back of your head. Here's a photograph that it's a portrait. Um, as I was walking by, I you know asked these uh, um, two young men if I could take their picture. Um, and the the guy in the blue just started to get down, like almost to start to pose. And I had to stop him and I'd just be like, no, no, hold up. Uh, just stay exactly how you were. Like you look fantastic how you are. And just by doing that, he just, you know, went exactly how he looked when I walked upon the scene. Um, and it, so it, it's a portrait, but it feels candid. It feels real. And so sometimes like when you're doing a portrait in these situations, all like the only direction people need is just to say like, you know, um, just uh, be comfortable, do something. You know, I, I just want to get to know you with the camera. Just, um, uh, you know, pose yourself, I can help you if you need, um, just do something that feels comfortable. And by giving them that simple uh, direction, um, it really allows them to take control of, of how they're gonna look.
here's one where, um, you know, in these areas, you, you want to get a certain percentage of the photographs to be of people, of course, but it, you know, you can go weeks without getting it. You know, you can walk 10 blocks without even seeing a person, let alone getting a good photograph. So here's one where I just kind of uh, was getting kind of, you know, fed up. I was like, you know, when's the next good photograph going to come or the one that I like. Um, and I saw this abandoned building and I went to photograph it. Uh, and then I just, you know, caught this great moment of um, uh, teenagers smoking weed behind the, the building. Um, and this genre in general, I think it's a very optimistic genre. I think to do it best, you have to be optimistic um, because there's a lot of, you're going to go many days, uh, weeks um, without getting good photographs um, and you can get down about it. Um, but you have to be optimistic that around the next corner, the best photograph is going to be there because uh, if you're not, um, you know, often it'll just pop and disappear before you're able to photograph it. Uh, and you'll, you'll miss moments by not having that optimism. Um, if you have uh, ever have the time, um, one of the most beautiful places in New York uh, to visit uh, is Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. It's the highest point in Brooklyn and it's absolutely stunning. Um, this was, uh, before Central Park was um, created, this was the second highest uh, touristed place in the US um, right behind Niagara Falls. And the final tip, as I said a few times, um, repetition I think is like absolutely the most important thing for this genre and why I recommend small cameras and things. Um, I think it's, you know, in, like it's good if you can go out and photograph half days and as often as possible. But um, I think it's really important to just take a camera for a walk, you know, around your neighborhood. Um, just shoot as often as possible. I'll, I'll leave early for appointments and I'll leave 15 minutes just uh, so I can walk and take a photograph. Um, with my mailing list right now, I'm doing a contest. Uh, it works especially well with the pandemic. Um, but I think it's important even without it. Um, the project is just do an entire, you know, set of images. In this case, I, I had people send me five based only, you can only take photographs within five blocks from your home. Um, it, you can take photographs in your home, things like that, but uh, uh, that's the you know distance and you got to just kind of focus there. Um, I think it's a great thing to do. There's some great front yard displays uh, near where I live. Um, so I like photographing them. photograph where you live. This photograph and uh, this photograph were quasi candid, quasi quick portraits where I just gave the person like a quick nod, like, you know, can I take this picture? Um, and then I, I took it after they uh, gave me the yes. Uh, so it's exactly how they looked before. Now forget it all, be instinctive, be spontaneous and have fun. Um, so I went over a lot of stuff here, but I think that really it's just to enjoy the walk and take photographs. Um, and you can think about everything uh, I said here when you're editing or when you're preparing for the day, um, but try not to think too hard when you're actually out photographing and enjoying yourself. Um, and so just quickly, I'm gonna um, uh, share. Uh, screen just for anyone who's interested. I just want to kind of show my website because I have some resources for people who want to um, learn more. Um, so, some a couple free resources. If you go under books, that's where a lot of the resources are. Um, so, uh, right here, um, I have a history of street photographers, um, and I think one of the important pillars to becoming good at this genre is to learn the work of different photographers, see how they did it. And you know, take the little bits and pieces from each photographer that you like and put it into your own work. So if you go here, I have lists of city and urban, um, American and suburban, uh, and foreign. And uh, so you can go through and you can click on, um, uh, I mentioned Alex Soth, you can click on each photographer and you know, get a whole write up um, with their photographs. Um, you can see some of the portraits here um, that he's taken. Um, so there's that, um, anyone looking for, uh, um, cameras for street photography. I have an article here, the best cameras for street photography. Um, highly recommend Fuji's, but all uh, camera, all camera companies these days make good cameras for street photography. Um, and then uh, I love street photography books. Uh, it's one of my favorite things um, to collect. And so I have a, 
um, a list here of my favorite ones um, with little write-ups so you can kind of go through there. Um, now, uh, I do offer um, street photography workshops for anyone who's, you know, interested in coming to the city. So you can see I offer private daily ones, um, you know, uh, just one-on-one. Um, and then I do, uh, when, of course, like the pandemic stuff is over, I do uh, weekend group workshops, um, which are really fun. It's usually about nine or 10 people on those. Um, and then finally, I have two things here, um, a free guide, the New York Photographer's Travel Guide for anyone who's um, traveling to New York, you can get that. Um, and then the final thing uh, is um, the essentials of street photography. And so I'm gonna set up a, a code uh, right after this um, to get, if you want a 50% off, uh, you can just put in Hamilton um, and get 50% uh, off. But this, uh, I wrote it about eight years ago and just came out with a, a new version. Um, it's two books in one. It's the essentials of street photography and street photography conversations. Um, the first one is, you know, everything I talked about in more, in more depth than 169 pages. The second book is um, interviews with eight uh, well-known street photographers in completely different, with, with completely different styles. And so they all talk about, you know, how they develop their work and, and show their photographs. Um, and so that's really interesting uh, as well. Um, so that's everything. Let me go back to uh, Zoom and uh, stop sharing. Um, so I hope you all enjoyed that. Um, does anybody uh, have any questions? Yes, James, how has mm -hmm. the COVID uh, pandemic affected your work? Um, well, it has meant that my two-year-old is now home full-time, and so he's just kicking my butt uh, and giving me no energy for photography. So that's <laughs> for, that's the first answer. Um, you know, I, to be honest, I have not been in, to Manhattan in about four months. Um, I do have a lot of uh, photographer friends who, you know, are there. Um, as it's, you know, things are opening up here, um, and uh, kind of slowly um, and people are starting to be careful, but still photograph more. Um, I, I do think um, when I talked about the Brooklyn project I was doing, which is a little bit slower and a little bit more portraits, um, I'm gonna be shooting that way for a lot longer. Um, you know, I'm not gonna be doing the kind of close, you know, quick, quick camera close to people because, you know, that's in New York, I think that is now not gonna be kosher for a while until, you know, everything is safe again. Um, but really the photography that I'm, I'm doing now, uh, with the time I'm able to is I'm, I'm continuing that Brooklyn project. So I'm going for a walk with the big camera. Um, I'm, you know, I am able to do some portraits of people, you know, that are kind of maybe coming out of their house uh, and don't have masks and, uh, you know, it's from a little bit of a distance and, and I can try to get some decent stuff that way. Um, but I'm, I'm doing a lot of backgrounds as well and trying to capture, uh, I'm still, you know, capturing photographs I love. Uh, it's just certain things I'm putting, you know, a lot of the people shots I'm, I'm putting a little bit more on hold. Uh, I'm getting some, but it's, it's a lot less than normal. Um, anybody else uh, have a question? I just have a quick question. Um, living in New York, you obviously get a lot of great themes and topics and ideas, mm -hmm. but what kind of advice do you have for people who live in much, much, much smaller towns and mm -hmm. suburbs and really boring places? Uh, totally. And that's, I mean, I think the most important question uh, to ask. And it's one of the things where the grass is like always greener. I have people say like, oh, you're so lucky you're in New York. It's everything so interesting there. Um, some of my favorite photographers uh, and the ones that inspire me the most are the ones that do this type of work in completely other areas. Um, and I just, you know, kind of I actually wish that I would, you know, had time to, you know, live and photograph in areas like that. Um, the first thing I would say is like to do, educate yourself uh, on photographers who have done um, similar work. Uh, so if you go through that um, history of street photographers um, and you kind of read some of the snippets, you'll see there's a bunch of photographers on there who shoot, you know, in kind of quieter areas. William Eggleston is one. Um, I'm trying to think of others. Uh, uh, Todd Hedo is another. Um, I can bring up this page real quick. Oh, oops. Um, and just tell you a couple from that list. Um, Alex Soth, as I mentioned, um, just give me two seconds for this page to open up. Um, I, you know, Robert Frank did a lot of this work in quieter areas. Um, Lee Friedlander's on that list, who's great um, and did it in those type of areas. Uh, Trent Park is on the list and, and uh, did it in those type of areas. So those are the ones I, from that page that I would, uh, I focus on the most and that'll really you'll see these d different images um and it it opened me up to like being like hey you know 
I, I, that's fascinating. I never thought to photograph that um, and it can make it interesting. But I would also do, do the project that I mentioned just um, five blocks from your home or you know, if you live in the middle of nowhere, you can widen that obviously. But uh, you know, pick an area, you may find it boring. You may not you know, think that you can get good photographs there and just try to capture as many Im uh, interesting images as you can. Just keep going over and over. Uh, and I, I think you will start to find really interesting photographs, but it just takes a, a little time to get, kind of get used to the, the whole idea. And if you're photographing, say, in Manhattan, mm -hmm. uh, you bring out uh, some artificial lighting, uh, are you going to get into trouble like uh, with the authorities? And... So, I mean, you, you want, you're allowed to do it with like a flash and stuff. I prefer not to use a flash just because um, it causes more problems and makes people more uncomfortable. Um, so I just use the lighting from, uh, you know, uh, the, the available light that I can use. Um, but you won't have a problem from the authorities, uh, but um, there may be a chance that you might have a problem from the person you're photographing. Um, so it's definitely a situation to be a little bit more careful with. Um, but there are a lot of photographers who use flash and they um, do it incredibly well. So my favorite photographers uh, use flash. Um, it's just not something that I personally um, feel comfortable using. Do you, are there times when you need a permit to photograph in New York, like Manhattan? Or um, not on the streets. Um, uh, not like, you know, if you're shooting, you know, the only time I've ever gotten a permit is shooting in Grand Central with a tripod. Um, you can <laughs> shoot subway systems handheld. You can't shoot subway systems with a tripod. Um, but no, I've never had to get a permit. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, anybody else uh, have a question? Okay, so I think we'll we'll end it there. Um, I hope you all enjoyed the presentation. Um, if anyone has any uh, further questions, um, just feel free to email me at any point um, during the days. I'm I'm stuck at home with a two year old, so getting uh, emails from other photographers is like a good ding, which I really enjoy. So I, I, I enjoy the, the conversations, um, and so I hope you're all you know stay well through all of this. <clears throat> Well, thank you very much, James. Um, it was very enjoyable and informative, and I see there's quite a few people who've um, echoed the same responses in the chat window, and I appreciate that you took the time to um, provide us with this presentation this evening. Yep. Thank you all. Have a great one. Now, thank you. I said right. you were going to record it, so how would we get Oh, actually, uh, speaking, I'm going to stop the recording right now. Uh,